it's an absolute honor actually to be among you and especially uh, in this I would say historic setting where we're not physically together but I've I've seldomly experienced so much togetherness um, than I have in the past few days with you guys um, and as a matter of fact I didn't do it yesterday but um, we're going to talk about energy and Nikola Tesla, and it's, it's going to be somewhere in the talk, he, he stated once, if you wish to understand the universe, think about energy, frequency, and vibration. And for me, I've, I've had the feeling for a very long, long time that making music and working in the field of energy is basically the same thing. It's got to do with harmony, and it's got to do with, um, uh, with, with, with transmitting energies and it's got to do with frequencies and it's got to do with vibration. And, and, and here's my dearly beloved, it's a very old, very old guitar, but you know, if, 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 if and, and what I, what I love is, do you, do you guys know the internet? Are you guys on the internet? Cause, cause I love the internet and it's, it's when I, when I do this here, There's a transmission of frequencies that is going, that's digitalized on the one end, and then it's it's actually turned into an acoustic signal on your end again. Wherever you are in the world, and whichever time zone you're in, you're hearing this chord, and I love that because it's interconnecting all of us in a far more physical way than we than we than we deemed possible a couple of years ago. Um, so, well, this this is my passion. And, uh, and energy is my passion also, and cycling, because I'm half Dutch. Um, so, rethinking energy. And first off, I, I, I wanted to start with this slide, uh, uh, which, which, which I love. Um, where is it? Let me see. Ah, there it is. Um, there cannot be a crisis this week, because my schedule is already full. Which ones of you have ever experienced a crisis? And I, I used to ask this question to, to audiences, and by now I know that all of the audiences that I'll be in have once experienced a crisis, the one that we're in right now. Um, and did it, was it timely? No, it wasn't, because that's what crises are. They're never timely, but they steepen our learning curve, um, and, and they, they, they aid us to, to, to develop ourselves so much in such a short amount of time. I was just, I'm, I'm working with, a couple of professors in, uh, in, in, um, in some universities and um, I was talking to them last week over, uh, over Zoom and, uh, and, 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 and they were talking about how for 10 years they had tried to um, um, innovate into online courses at their universities and then COVID happened and within a week they made the entire transition. So this is what the power of a crisis is. It actually enables us to change very quickly into a direction that we've been preparing for for 10 years already. Um, humans, I love humans. I hope you do too. Humans are a unique species. There are so many species in the world. There, there's, I think there are 8.7 million species populating the face of the earth, and we're just one of them. But we are unique in a certain way. Why? Because we are the only living organism that produces squares. I was flying over Canada when I was still allowed to uh, a while ago, and this is what I saw when I looked out of the airplane. The entire country was divided into squares, one by one mile, all of them. This is, this is a part of Canadian history, apparently. It's one by one square parcels. Whatever nature was planning, it, was, it got divided. And it's, it, it makes us a strange species. That, that we're the only ones that actually thinks in square shapes. We're also, and this is a bit of a sad fact, we are the only species that produces a kind of waste that is not regarded to be food by other species, which means that we are the only end station. We are the only species that can be a consumer, finishing something up rather than being part of a cycle. That's strange, isn't it? Now there's many species that know how to fool others, either of their own sort or of other sorts. Think about mimicry, think about camouflage, think about this dog, day 137, 
and they still think that he's one of them. So these are animals fooling others. But we seem to be the only species that has found out how to fool ourselves, how to make some things more important in our heads than they actually are, despite of other things that are actually important and that we do not have an eye for. For example, this is a sad fact, but I believe that there's an opportunity in this also. Um, we can think ourselves larger than we are, but it also enables us to grow. Now we're gonna go into energy. Let's look at the Earth first. Beautiful planet. As far as we know, it's a rather unique planet also. And it's more or less a closed system. There's a certain amount of atoms that this entire planet consists of, and it's been kind of stable for the past four and a half billion years. Five times 10 to the power of 49 atoms is what the Earth consists of. Now, the way in which these atoms are arranged in all kinds of different molecules varies, but this is the amount of atoms. Also, the Earth is a closed system, more or less energy-wise. 5.4 times 10 to the power of 41 joules is what the Earth consists of. This is it. This is the planet. It's all matter and energy. So if you think about the solar radiation that's entering into the Earth's atmosphere every day, about the same amount is leaving the Earth's atmosphere also. The amount of energy that is encapsulated within the Earth, within the core of the Earth, has been stable for quite a while. I'd say a couple of billion years. So the amount of energy that the Earth consists of is the same. The amount of atoms that the Earth consists of is the same. What does this say about our planet? What does it say about us? What does this say about our economy, where we think about growth? It actually proves the Club of Rome right. There are limits to growth because we not, can, cannot grow the amount of energy on Earth. We cannot grow the amount of atoms on Earth. The only thing that we can do, and this is something that was stated by Lavoisier, a French scientist, um, in, in the 1700s. In nature, nothing is created, nothing is lost, things only transform. So all our growth, all our progress as humans, has not to do with creating stuff out of nothing. It has to do with transformation. And this is exactly what we are about. We are the transforming species. Tesla, I already mentioned it, said, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. I just love this quote. Energy, frequency, and vibration. It seems like everything has to do with that. Now, energy. What is energy? In 2006, I actually started as an energy professional. Um, after uh, some, some, some trials and errors in the uh, online tech industry. And, uh, and after some trials and errors as musicians also, actually. So I worked as a musician for a couple of years. Now, what is, what is energy? I asked this question to my professional colleagues that had been within that company for years already. Answers that they gave kind of sounded like this, Spanish answer. Um, we don't know what energy is. Even the energy professionals among us oftentimes do not know what energy is. Why? Apparently, there's a disconnect between us and the product that we had been selling for years. And this is really interesting because I've been in many, many rooms all over the globe in the past years. And I've been asking this question so often. And there's so many knowledgeable people, energy professionals in a room, and hardly anyone gives an answer. And this kind of tells us also that we are not in the position to talk about whether somebody's using a lot of energy or very little energy. We are not, we, we, we do not hold the wisdom on, on energy. We do not understand our product yet. Energy, if you think about it very long and very hard, so hard that you're gonna try and make it simple, you're not gonna end up saying energy is E equals MC square because then I'm gonna ask you, explain that then and then we're going to get stuck again. Energy, very simply put, is the ability to do work. 
scientifically correct would be the ability to do work over time. So there's a time element there also. Now, the ability to do work, if energy is the ability to do work, and we all might agree upon the fact that work is rather important in our society, in our economy, in our world, then the ability to do work is rather fundamental. What I'm stating here is that energy actually is the basis for the real economy, the tangible economy. Everything that you touch, use, everything that we make, everything that we produce, everything that we exchange, everything that we throw away exists because there has been a flow of energy somewhere, sometime, everything. All these companies, whether their business is in, in, in making car tires, uh, uh, um, transforming waste into, into products, um, issuing cryptocurrencies, um, broadcasting puppies and kittens videos on the internet, whatever business they're in, they can do that business because they are using energy in a process, transforming it from one form into another. It's fairly easy to run an energy system without a bank. We think that money is important, but have you tried running a bank without an energy system? It's impossible. Energy is the fundamental element in everything that we create that is deemed of value by somebody. Also, I'm stating that all energy on Earth actually is solar. All of it. Of course, the sun is emitting solar energy to the earth. That's an obvious one. But think about the wind. Wind exists because of solar activity and, and, and because of the revolving of the earth around the sun. Geothermal energy actually can be considered solar energy because the earth is actually a little bit of sun that was spewed out four and a half billion years ago. So there's a bit of sun encapsulated within the earth. And it's that energy that's being emitted through geothermal energy. Oil and coal and gas are forms of solar energy. Why? Photosynthesis. It's because of the sun that plants grew. Then the plants died. And over millions of years, oil and coal and gas became forms of processed solar energy. It's not renewable because the process is so, 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 so long. It takes so much effort to turn plants into oil, coal, and gas, but it is a form of solar energy. If you would, if you would put solar energy in a renewables chart, it would be somewhere on the bottom because it will take millions of years to regenerate the same amount of oil and coal and gas out of converting plants into, into them. But still, it's solar energy. Also, and this is a very interesting one, we very oftentimes think of energy in terms of scarcity. It seems like the, 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 the entire economy is revolving around scarce forms of energy that somebody can own, put their flag on, put a price on them, sell them as commodities, and then you're gonna use them, pay the bill. That can only exist because the resources are scarce. The sad part is we are depleting them in the same time. Now, there is, a vast abundance of energy available on Earth. Solar radiation alone that hits the Earth's surface is more than 1,400 times the amount of energy that the entire humanity is using today. This actually is, it's, it's easy to explain in, in an image that I haven't used in this keynote, but this means that if the surface of Spain, I'm sorry, Daniel, is covered by solar panels, then they will generate enough energy, not only electricity, but also heat, all the energy that we need for our mobility, for our industries, enough energy comes from the surface of Spain to power the entire earth, all of humanity. And Spain is only one thousandth of the earth's surface, 500,000 square kilometers, that's it. So, there's a vast abundance. What we need to learn is to tap into that abundance, to harvest from abundant resources rather than scarce resources, 
But this requires something much, much bigger than only a shift of technologies. I'll get to that later. Energy and peace and energy and conflict are very closely related. This is the Global Peace Index, which is a beautiful data set, very elaborate, issued every year. Basically, it says if you live in a green country, you're really lucky to be living there. If you live in a red country, or you're going to do everything within your powers to live in a green country. Everything. Now, if you're plotting the places on Earth where we are deriving the most energy from, it's usually in the red and orange countries. And why? Because energy and conflict are very closely related. And why is that? Because most of the energy that we are using on Earth today is ownable. And if somebody owns an oil field, somebody else will want to own that oil field. So be it for political reasons, commercial reasons, personal reasons, there will be conflict because somebody is owning a piece of land. Now, what is ownership on this earth that is four and a half billion years old? And we live only 80 years. What is ownership? So when we shift from ownable resources to non-ownable resources, like the sun, like the wind, abundant resources, like geothermal energy, then also the face of the earth will change in terms of geopolitics. The face of the earth will change in terms of conflict. Most of the conflicts of the past century were fought more or less over energy resources. South Sudan, the South Chinese Sea, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Russia, the North Dakota pipeline. I could go on and on and on. This image is very special and very dear to me. And it was actually given to me by um, somebody that I met at, at an EBBF event years ago when they were still held in the Netherlands, 2006 or 2007. And it was Lawrence Stout. At that time, he was the director of the Irish Energy Institute. And he asked me, what do you see here? And what we see here is a timeline and a peak. And what does it say? This is fossil fuel consumption by humans throughout our history and future. This shows so much. This, for me, was a paradigm shift, personally. Why? Because it shows that we refer to oil and coal and gas as conventional energy. But over our history, when we zoom out, it's actually alternative. It is an alternative to renewables that we have always used to fulfill some short-term needs that have enabled us over the past 150 years to progress really, really quickly, become very mobile, become very productive, become very smart. And we have to thank fossil fuels for that. And we are here now. We're on the verge of making this immense move all the way back to 100% renewables. Why? Because on the one hand, we are depleting resources. We're using fossil fuels one million times faster than the Earth is generating them. One million times faster. So that's some serious depletion. But also, I think that we are finding something better than fossil fuels. And what is the beauty of that? The beauty of that is um, by finding something better, we don't need to deplete fossil fuels to the end. We're shifting to other forms of using and generating energy in the meantime. There's a beautiful precedent to this also. The Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. I think we did find something better than stones. Same will go and goes for energy today. The energy transition is so much more than technological innovation alone. Of course, technology is a very important part of the energy transition. Shutting down coal-fired plants and replacing them by solar fields, for example. But what about the economical transition? Because renewable resources can be applied by anyone to, to generate energy out of. Anyone. You and I from our rooftops, our gardens, and even the shares that we can hold in wind farms somewhere else, the geothermal pits that we may dig, 
enable all of us to generate energy out of resources that might be non-ownable and that will provide us in what we need. This actually makes a huge economic shift. Sec the third is societal, because it also bears us with responsibilities. If we can make something that was controlled by big powers somewhere else, and we can bring it into the market, bring it into the society, bring it into the economy, then this changes a lot. And fourth, last but not least, uh, there's an institutional change embedded within the energy transition also, because the laws of yesterday cannot do with the energy system of tomorrow. There's four big trends that have to do with this energy transition also. The one is, we're moving away from volume-based businesses to value-based businesses. It's no longer about how much I've been able to sell to you guys. It's about the amount of value that this transaction has created on a systemic level. So it's pointless to be proud of the fact that I've sold 1 million kilowatt hours because what has been done with them? From scarcity to abundance is another trend. Scarcity-based models are very closely linked to ownable, scarce, depletable resources. But if all energy would come from the sun, wind, waves, insides of the earth, then suddenly the entire model is changing because it's abundance-based. It also implies that ownership is no longer a requirement. Interestingly enough, the more abundant it becomes, the less interesting it becomes to own it. Still, we need it though. Then there's a shift from consumer to prosumer. We, as humans, finally can be one of all the other species on the face of this earth and no longer consume energy. All of us have something that we need and something that we can give. So we become prosumers, producers and users at the same time. Fourth, centralized models are shifting into distributed models. Because, for example, in the Netherlands, we used to have something like 30 places where energy was generated and millions of places where energy was used. Now suddenly we're moving to a system where millions of places are actually generating and using energy. This is a picture that my mother took of me, my brother, and my neighbor. There's me in the middle, then there's Omid next to me, and then there's Amadou, our neighbor. We're watching television. This is in Niger. This is where I grew up. My parents were doing development work there. Watching television is a big thing there. We had one of the two televisions in our town. We were lucky enough to be able to watch it if there was electricity, because we did have power cuts every day. Still in Niger, power cuts are a daily reality. Even more so in Niger today, 16% of the people have access to modern forms of energy. It is the seventh most energy poor country in the world in terms of access. Which is strange because it's actually extremely rich in energy. Niger is the fourth largest uranium exporter in the world. But the people of Niger cannot touch their own resources. They'll go to France for free. More interestingly, Niger holds the second best solar potential globally. Now, tapping into this potential is democratizing the people of Niger. And it's happening right now. This, was, this is the school that I used to attend in Dosso, Ecole Tondobo. No electricity access still. This is me and my brother in front of our classroom. And again, years later. Inside the classroom, I found the annual roster that was made by the teachers. It looks like this. This is Excel, analog Excel, Excel with no electricity. It's very time consuming. This was the reality that I grew up in. What if all this time to put lines on a piece of paper could actually be used to educate children. Because that's what electricity may provide. 
This is my teacher, Monsieur Torodo. I met him after 26 years. He hadn't changed one bit except for the one thing on his ear, his mobile phone. Now, I asked him, in a country where almost nine out of 10 people have no access to modern forms of energy, how do you all carry these mobile phones? Where do you charge them? And he took me to a little shop on the side of the street. And he said, we charge our phones with diesel. There's a diesel generator on one end. There's AC outlets on the other. You pay the shop owner. You wait for an hour and a half. Your phone is full. This is a business model. It's a sad business model because there's a diesel generator. For me, it's a litmus proof of, of a, a litmus test of, of poverty. If people in the street know the diesel price. Now, all these kiosks by now are one by one being converted into solar. And what difference does that make? The difference that it makes is that roughly you require the same investment in solar panels as this shop owner would require in a diesel generator. But after that, he no longer has to buy diesel on a day-to-day -day basis. The sun is shining for free and he can run his business. His income is actually increasing by 30% by this transition alone. The mobile phone grid in Niger for lack of a physical grid interconnecting the country is actually solar powered because this was the only technology that lend itself for a quick rollout of mobile telephony. This is interesting. This is a huge leapfrog. And it also grew many people in Niger accustomed with the power of the sun. This is the street that I grew up in. Still, there's no pavement, but there are solar powered light, light posts. And at night, kids gather underneath these light posts to make their homework. Electrical light is changing lives because suddenly they can make homework. I met with a young guy in Niger two years ago when I was there on a mission, an EU, an EU mission. Um, he had a startup in robotics, agricultural robotics. And I asked him, how did you learn about this? And he said, Wikipedia and YouTube. He went to YouTube University and Wikipedia University. He got his degrees in robotics from that. And he's starting up a company. And he's addressing some true issues within the country using modern technologies that he could learn of because he had a smartphone and access to some form of electricity. Electricity is changing lives. Renewable energy, I believe, so firmly should be available to and makeable by and shareable for every human being, period. It is strange by now, with all the knowledge and all the technology that we have, that there's still 1.3 billion people in the world that have no access to modern forms of energy whatsoever. There's 2.9 billion people that live in energy poverty and rely on biomass for cooking. You're trapped in poverty if you live in energy poverty. You're never going to attain financial wealth if you remain energetically poor. So we should address alleviating energy poverty first, because then we can educate then we can share, then we can partake in the economy, then we can partake in society, then we can live up to our potential. Buckminster Fuller stated, you don't change things by fighting the existing reality. That's pointless. If you wanna change something, build models that are going to make the old model obsolete. I love this because this actually says something about our personal energy. I could easily spend all of my personal energy into trying to, to tell what is wrong with the world. And it's pointless because I'm not providing an alternative in the meantime. I could also choose to use that same amount of energy to, 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 to build something that may make the old model obsolete. Almost became a life mantra for me. And one of these new models is the internet of energy. Now, I guess that you all guys are familiar with this concept of the internet. Everything is connected to everything else. I sometimes say that this is, it's a form of Buddhism because everything is connected. Now, if we look at the birth of the web, in 1973, 
This was a full map of the internet. It wasn't called the internet yet, it was called the ARPA net. ARP, uh, and, 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 and this was a full map, this was all of it. And now there's billions and billions and billions of users globally using the internet consciously, unconsciously, every day. Because of this guy, Tim Berners-Lee, who in 1989 wrote the WWW protocol, I was one of the lucky ones because of my mother, who was a visionary, to be, uh, she was one of the first to be online in the Netherlands in 1989. We had DOS prompts and loud modems and, 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 and I had to learn to code. Actually, she made me learn, she made me code stuff. And it's, it's been, it's been, this has been such a help for me in all of my life. The WWW protocol that was written in 1989 is, is aided and supported by so many other protocols and standards, but they enable us to be connected today. They enable, enable me to tell these stories to you guys, wherever you are in the world, without having to check what kind of devices you're holding. You can choose for any technology, it's agnostic and still we're connected. I could play music and it was transmitted to your place in almost real time. I love, I love, I love the internet. It, it, it enabled us to move very quickly from a centralized knowledge distribution model to a distributed model. The centralized knowledge distribution model is where some power holds the knowledge like Webster's Dictionary or the Winkler Prints Encyclopedia. And by now they've been reduced to a pile of biomass in our, in our, in our cupboards, in our cabinets. Why? Because, because we don't have to go through the publisher anymore and wait a couple of years for the new release of the dictionary to, to find some changes. We're on Wikipedia now. Anyone who knows something that the rest does not may add it to Wikipedia and then everybody can know it. It's a distributed model. So we've ended being knowledge consumers and we have become energy prosumers already, or, or uh, knowledge prosumers already. With energy, we're doing the same thing now. This is the model that we are moving away from, the centralized energy distribution model. It looks like this, it's very sexy. And then we're moving through these kinds of models where we're talking decentralized energy, like the rooftop of Rotterdam Central Station. And then through this, we're moving to an entirely interconnected system called the Internet of Energy, where you can no longer see whether somebody is a producer or a consumer. Everything is everything. Everything is interconnected. So this is the energy Buddhism that I sometimes refer to. The Internet of Energy is peer-to-peer -peer by nature. It's balance-seeking, like everything else in nature. It's supporting and growing local energy communities, and it does it in a multi-carrier way. It's not about electricity alone. It's also about heat. It's also about molecules, like hydrogen molecules, biogas molecules, you name it. So, building up local energy communities and it has to do so much with optimizing energy flows. Why? Because energy, energy is a game of loss mitigation. You want to lose as little as possible between the resource and use. So the more locally you can use energy, the more locally you can generate it, the less you have to transport it, the less you have to convert it from one form into the other, the less you have to store of it, the more you're gonna end up with at the end of the line. So it's optimizing, it's an optimization game. And we're using digital technologies for that. We're way into artificial intelligence for this, for example. And one of the big drivers for the Internet of Energy is the Internet of Things. Today already, over 10 billion devices, apart from our laptops and phones, is connected to the Internet. I know for a fact that all of these devices can use energy. They all need energy. Many of these devices are generating energy in one form or the other. Every solar panel, almost every solar panel is an IoT connected device, for example. And many of these devices actually have energy as a residual flow, like the secondhand heat that escapes from my 
from the back of my fridge. What if I can capture that heat and use it for something else? What if the back of my fridge actually might help my oven to be a little bit more effective? Then you're gonna get all these very, very smart systems. On the internet of energy, every connected user is going to be exchanging energy with one another. It's gonna be peer to peer. It's gonna be from every resource that you can think of in every suitable form and it's going to be utilizing intelligent grids. In four Ds, the Internet of Energy can be, can be uh, um, explained as distributed, digitalized, decommoditized, because it's not about volumes anymore, it's not about selling stuff anymore, and democratized, because it's everybody's, or it's nobody's. To me, that's the same thing. Now we know that on the internet, we're using the HTTP protocol a lot. Hypertext transfer protocol. I would love to see that on the internet of energy, we're gonna use the PTTP protocol, standing for power to the people. Let's get together and write this protocol. Because that would mean that you're going to get free energy and everybody's going to get free energy and Oprah said it right. Now, let's get to the end of this story. In the beginning, I was referring to us as a square making species. Today, as a, one of the first experiments, city builders, designers are collaborating to design cities that no longer consist of squares. This is a circular city in Korea, or circular park in Korea, where every space is overlapping other spaces, where you have a space of your own and an overlapping space that you share with somebody else. So there's no divides anymore. I love this concept. I was also referring to us as the waste-making species. We still are. But I was in Ireland two years ago um, in Dublin at university. And there they found out that the common mealworm is actually eating its way through styrofoam and converting that into bio waste, their own poo, which is then again being used by every other organism in the world. So perhaps with little critters like the common mealworm, we can finally get rid of our waste piles also. The third thing that I mentioned was we are the species that does not only fool others, but also ourselves. Will we still be doing that? I don't know, but I do hope so. Why? Because we, out of all the species that are populating Earth, are the thinking species. We are the species that carries knowledge. We are the species that can grow in immaterial ways. So yes, there are limits to growth materially, but, but there are no limits to our evolution. There are no limits to our spiritual development. We are the species that recognizes beauty in big things, in very small things. We are the species that even creates beauty, like Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. We are the species that feels compassion, interconnectedness, like with my teacher in Niger. There's so much I owe to him. We are the species that recognizes patterns in nature and can translate these patterns into our own worlds, our own physical realities, like the Fibonacci pattern that we just watched. My dream is universal access to clean, renewable energy for every human being. I actually want energy to be a human right. And I would love to invite you all to dream and dream big and co-develop and then turn these developments into action because in the end, there's no substitute for action. We can think of everything. We can conceptualize everything. We can theoreticalize everything. But in the end, it's all about the action. So thank you so much for all your patience. And uh, I'm looking forward. My favorite part of these, uh, 
of these sessions is the Q&A, I have to say.